Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Queen of the Holy Rosary Church. Uh, several months ago, uh, we had a guest speaker come to our church and give us two presentations. One was on the uh, sacred burial cloths of Christ, which the Shroud of Turin is, is one of those. And the other presentation was about Eucharistic miracles. And both of those presentations were very interesting, very informative, and uh, and really help help with my faith. Uh, tonight we have uh, the same person coming back, Richard uh, Bernaches, and tonight he's going to be talking about life after life. And that kind of comes to a really important question for all of us, and that question is, what happens after we die? And uh, Richard will will uh, be giving. Uh, talking about near-death experiences and how people's lives were changed. And I think that uh, it's, it's something that we can all appreciate. Uh, I think it'll, it'll help us in our faith and help us uh, know how we should live our lives. So uh, please welcome Richard Bernaches. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, so my wife, Pat, and I, we travel all over the country to various parishes, schools, and religious communities, bringing what we hope are faith-building experiences. And, of course, we're really happy to be back here at Queen of the Holy Rosary uh, for this uh, third and uh, final, I guess, uh, within the grouping of the three projects that we have. Uh, so uh, very happy to be here. And uh, if you join me in the glory be, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. So consider the following situation. A revived person, brought back from the brink of death, angrily chastises their rescuer. What do you think may have happened during their near-death experience to trigger this response. We'll be exploring this unexpected and confusing reaction during our time together today. So by way of example, the chief resident doctor at a children's hospital in Little Rock, Arkansas, witnessed a near-death experience that changed his entire approach to medicine. This doctor was called upon to resuscitate a seven-year-old boy who had a near-fatal reaction to chemotherapy. When he shocked Michael with paddles to restart his heart, the boy's eyes sprung open and flashed with anger. Several weeks later, he was called by the boy as he passed his room. Doctor, where is Jesus? The doctor didn't know what to say, but finally said, He's everywhere. That's not what I mean, said the boy. What did you do to make Jesus go away? Jesus and I were above you, watching you put a tube into my throat. Then you shocked me with that machine, and you made Jesus go away. Why did you do that? I'm mad at you for making him go away. The doctor said, we were trying to help you. The boy responded, I know that, but I was all right with Jesus, and I didn't want to come back. Jesus was taking care of me. In another case, a cardiologist was resuscitated by one of his peers. Upon returning to life, he was looking up at a doctor with paddles in his hands. He said, don't ever do that to me again. It was a shock to my friend who had worked so hard to save me. Following the resuscitation from the jaws of death, people often describe an encounter with a being of light, acknowledged to be God, who gives them an awesome, welcoming experience of love, joy, warmth, and compassion. So for the first 800 years of the church, there is no record of anyone having challenged the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. Today, 
only 30% of practicing Catholics believe in the real presence, despite Eucharistic miracles taking place throughout the world, wherein the consecrated host is changing into heart tissue. I wonder how many of our professed Catholic brothers and sisters believe in an afterlife. Please close your eyes and listen carefully to the introduction to the Gospel of John, focusing especially on references to the light. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came for testimony to bear witness to the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness to the light, the true light that enlightens every man was coming into the world. So here's a brief sampling of just a few other scriptural passages that refer to the being of light. So what happens when we die? The answer to this most important of questions deals not only with our immortality, that is, how we will spend every moment following death for eternity, but also should impact every aspect of how we live our lives leading up to the moment of the death of our physical bodies. It is my hope that you will leave today with an enhanced understanding of how we should be living our lives, knowing what lies ahead. So let's introduce a few presumably unfamiliar terms that we will encounter during this presentation. A near-death Excuse me, a near-death episode is the physical situation in which a person survives having been close to death. A near-death experience, or an NDE, is a person's consciousness functioning apart from one's physical body that takes place during a near-death episode. And consciousness refers to awareness of oneself in the world. We will explore what happens as a person approaches death, crosses over to the other side, and is then resuscitated. We will learn how thousands of NDEers from all over the world, from all walks of life, are speaking of their certainty concerning life after death. NDE researcher Sherry Sutherland found that prior to their NDE, half of those in her study believed in an afterlife, whereas after the NDE, 100% believed in an afterlife. So how do we know that NDE reports are real and not simply made up stories? So most NDE researchers are medical doctors who became interested after hearing resuscitated patients who had been medically dead discuss similar experiences of what happened when they were dead. We will explore scientific investigations of thousands of patients published in the most respected, peer-reviewed medical journals. We will not be discussing autobiographies of personal near-death experiences, that is, people who are financially motivated in order to promote their stories. We will examine how an NDE affects a person what is referred to as after effects of an NDE. And finally, we will consider how knowledge of NDEs should impact the lives of all people, not just those who experience an NDE personally. Very extensive studies reveal that none of the traits shown, such as religious affiliation, age, behavioral issues, influence whether or not a person has a near-death experience during a near-death episode. Hundreds of millions of people have had 
NDEs. Dr. Melvin Morris performed a 10-year study of non-volunteer persons who survived cardiac arrest using a scientifically valid protocol. He found that NDEs are associated with the dying process and are clearly not caused by any of the criteria presented by skeptics, such as drugs, sleep deprivation, dreams, or hallucinations. So here are some of the more common features reported by near-death experiencers. The number and types of fe features experienced depends upon how close to irreversible death the NDE reaches. So we have a distortion of the sense of time, an out-of-body experience, entering some unearthly realm, a sense of warmth or lack of pain, reaching a border, a point of no return, auditory phenomena such as music, encountering other beings, encountering a light, passing through a tunnel or a similar structure, or even having a life review. So to meet the criteria for inclusion in scientific studies, an NDE usually has to have at least seven of the 15 features associated with NDEs. So do scientists believe in God? In 2002, the annals, <clears throat> in 2022, the annals of the New York Academy of Sciences published a peer-reviewed paper calling for guidelines and standards for the study of death and recalled experiences of death. It is recognized as a topic deserving of scientific study. It acknowledged that consciousness survives physical death. This is a separation of a spirit life form from the body. We can expect to travel to an otherworldly place as well as experiencing a life review. Now a survey of scientists 20 years ago showed that only 45% of scientists self-identified as being theists, that is, belief in God or a higher power. However, a recent Pew Research study of scientists revealed a profound change in their belief, with 51% now identifying as theists. When data from younger scientists was separated out from the larger group, 66% of the young scientists stated that they were theists, indicating that the younger generation are far more likely to acknowledge a higher power. And in a separate study, 76% of physicians were found to believe in God. So this trend towards belief in God has been attributed to recent cosmological evidence and the study of near-death experiences. So 75% of people who have an NDE report having an out-of-body experience. At this time, their consciousness, their spirit, their soul leaves the body. It is self-conscious and capable of hearing and seeing without the need for ears or eyes. It appears to have acute recall and memory functions without use of the brain. It is not limited by gravity or physical restrictions such as walls or roofs. Reports include having observed or heard activity that is considered impossible for someone that is clinically dead. They are able to know the thoughts and feelings of those they encounter. In 1981, Pam Reynolds had a brain aneurysm which entailed a seven-hour surgical procedure to repair. The entire process was meticulously recorded in medical records. Her eyes were taped shut. Plugs were inserted in both of her ears that emitted a very loud clicking sound many times per second 
that prevented her from hearing any conversations. The purpose of the sound was to determine when her brain stopped processing the sounds. A bone saw was used to remove a section of her skull while another surgeon cut into her groin area for a blood bypass. When her body reached 70 degrees, her heart and her breathing were stopped. At 60 degrees, she experienced total brain shutdown. At this point, the bypass was begun and the blood was drained from her head. All metabolism to support brain function had been eliminated. The aneurysm was repaired while she was clinically dead for an hour. The bypass was then removed and her body temperature gradually restored to normal. Finally, her heart was restarted with defibrillator shocks. Under general anesthesia, it should not be possible to have a lucid, organized memory. No memory during cardiac arrest when combined with anesthesia should be possible. When Pam awoke, she reported she was brought to consciousness by the sound of the cranial saw. She said the sound caused her to pop out of the top of her head and that she came to rest at the neurosurgeon's shoulder. She saw and was able to describe the cranial saw that was kept encased until the moment it was needed. She was surprised that it resembled her electric toothbrush, had interchangeable blades, and that the storage case was similar to that her dad kept his socket wrenches in. She described the process by which her head was shaved. She was very confused as to why she saw a surgeon working on her groin area for brain surgery, not understanding the bypass surgery requirements. She heard the female surgeon tell the neurosurgeon that the artery in the right leg was too small and how the neurosurgeon had directed her to switch to the other leg. During her NDE, Pam was drawn into the presence of the light, where she encountered deceased loved ones. She returned to the operating room along with the deceased uncle, and upon seeing the condition of her body, did not want to re-enter it. She saw the body jump once, and upon a second jump, said her uncle pushed her back into her body. So Pam's experience was recreated and filmed up by the BBC as a documentary entitled, The Day I Died. So here we have a scriptural passage describing St. Paul's personal out-of-body experience. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. You've just heard of a woman who floated up above her body and observed the goings on. Here's another example. A woman was operated on under general anesthetic, and as soon as she woke up, she described her operation as if she had been on the ceiling. She also described the operation that took place in the next operating room. She saw a leg being amputated and placed in a yellow bag. A surgeon confirmed that the leg amputation had taken place exactly as she described in the next operating room at the very same time that she was totally disconnected from the world. Oftentimes, the NDE report includes passing through a tunnel while moving towards a bright light. Reports of NDEs go back millennium in history. This painting depicting that process was painted over 500 years ago. A four-year-old boy experienced a cardiac arrest during surgery. A few months later, following his recovery, his father asked him, what he would like to do for the day. The child replied that he wanted to go to the park. Puzzled by the request, 
His father asked him which park he meant. They had never visited a park where they were living. His son replied, the one through the tunnel, the one I went to when I was in the hospital. There was a park with lots of children and swings and things with a white fence around it. I tried to climb over the fence, but this man stopped me and said that I wasn't to come yet. And he sent me back down the tunnel, and I was back in the hospital again. Childhood NDEs are very similar to adult NDEs. One difference is that children are usually accompanied through the tunnel to the light by a being, often being led by their hand. Children's accounts are informative because they report exactly what they see without great concern over the rational interpretation of their observations. An infant of six months was admitted to an intensive care unit. Three years later, when her mother was explaining that she expected the grandmother to die soon, the child asked, will grandma have to go through the tunnel to get to see God? The light, which is often understood to be God, or the supreme being, or Jesus, is overwhelming and transmits joy, peace, pure, unconditional love, acceptance, and comfort. When encountering the light, all knowledge is finally revealed, and one becomes aware that this is our true and eternal home. The dying person feels completely surrounded by the light, completely at ease and accepted. In virtually every case, the light helps write the individual's life course and put them back on track again. One person reported, the light provided the incredible feeling of powerful, magnificent love. The light is so warm and so glowing and so forgiving. The light has no judgment. There was no condemnation. There was no blaming, no shame. There was nothing but love and acceptance. And the light was viewing me. The light knew everything I had ever thought, done, or will do. Another person reported, the light welcomed me. The light absorbed me into the light. So I was part of the light. And once I was in the light, I knew everything the light knew. I knew everything. I knew all the answers. Many experience a life review in which they come to understand the meaning of their life and how they have lived it and how it affected others. The life review is not just a watching of one's experiences as a passive spectator but rather a reliving of every moment of one's life in an instant. You're able to experience every thought, every little action or spoken word of your life, and know the emotion it evoked. The end result is that we are taught how to live. So let's examine what some people have said about their life reviews. Erica McKenzie had two life reviews, each beginning with the day of birth and ending at the time of death. During the first, all the great accomplishments were sh shown, prizes, awards, etc. But during the second, she saw none of these, but rather saw the things that were important to God. These were things like love and acts of kindness, things she couldn't even remember that she had done. Another person reported, I began to see my whole life unfolding before me like a film projected on a screen from babyhood to adult life. It was so real. I was looking at myself, but better than a 3D movie as I was also capable of sensing the feeling of the persons I had interacted with through the years. I could feel the good and bad emotions I made them go through. Another said, 
What I counted in life as unimportant was my salvation. And what I thought was important was nil. Another. Apparently nothing was omitted in this nightmare of injuries. But the most terrifying thing about it was that every pang of suffering I had caused others was now felt by me. In another, for each time I caused pain, I was shown an alternative action that I could have taken. The NDE isn't given just to those who have the experience. It's given to all of us to learn from. It is not judgmental or negative. In the life review, we judge ourselves. Some of the insignificant things from the material human perspective are very important spiritually. The life review is the ultimate teaching tool. So the life review reminds me of the scripture passage. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, by what they had done. And in the words of Jesus, Amen, I say to you, as long as you did it to one of these, my least brethren, you did it to me. So let's briefly, briefly explore the border or boundary that I mentioned earlier. Everyone that reaches the otherworldly place encounters a barrier, a boundary of some kind that they are not permitted to move beyond. A few minutes ago, I introduced a four-year-old boy that traversed the tunnel. You may recall that he tried to climb over a white fence, but was stopped and told he wasn't to come yet, and then returned to his body. Another young Indian reported, I approached the boundary. No explanation was necessary for me to understand at the age of 10 that once I crossed the boundary, I could never come back, period. The boundary can take many different forms. However, each person encountering it realizes the implication of crossing over, a point of no return. This is the story of Katie, a seven-year-old girl, as told by Dr. Melvin Morse in his book, Closer to the Light. Katie was found floating face down in a pool. An emergency CAT scan showed massive swelling of the brain. She was on a breathing machine. Emergency room physicians said she was a train wreck with less than a 10% chance of survival. Dr. Morse was the doctor who resuscitated her. She was one of the sickest children he had ever cared for. He was sure she was going to die. Three days later, she made a full recovery, one of those medical mysteries. When she felt well enough, he had a follow-up exam. Katie clearly remembered Dr. Morris. She turned to her mother and said, that's the one with the beard. First, there was this tall doctor who didn't have a beard, and then he came in. Her statement was correct. Katie remembered more. First I was in this big room, and then they moved me to a smaller room where they did x-rays on me. She accurately noted such details as having a tube down my nose. Most physicians intubate orally, and that's the com most common way that it's represented on television. She described many other details, even though her eyes were closed and she had been profoundly comatose during the entire experience. She still saw what was going on. Dr. Morris asked what she remembered about her drowning incident, hoping to learn the cause. She said, do you mean when I visited the Heavenly Father? I met Jesus and the Heavenly Father. Her first memory was of darkness and feeling so heavy she couldn't move. Then a tunnel opened and through that tunnel came Elizabeth. 
Elizabeth's was tall and nice with bright golden hair. She accompanied Katie up the tunnel where she saw her late grandfather and met several other people. Among her new friends were two young boys, souls waiting to be born, named Andy and Mark. At one point in the voyage, Katie was given a glimpse of her home. She went from room to room and observed what her family members were doing and wearing. Her parents were shocked that Katie was able to accurately describe all of these details, including the meal that her mom was preparing at the time. Finally, Elizabeth, who seemed to be a guardian angel to Katie, took her to meet the Heavenly Father and Jesus. When Jesus asked her if she wanted to see her mother again, she replied yes and awoke. Katie's first words in the ICU were, where are Mark and Andy? She repeatedly asked about them throughout her recovery. Dr. Morris probed her family's religious beliefs to see if she had been indoctrinated with belief in guardian angels and tunnels to heaven. Her mother was emphatic that Katie had not been. Her family was middle-of-the-road Mormon and did not believe in spirit guides or tunnels to heaven. Katie's incident is what led Dr. Morse to the study of near-death experiences. As you just heard, Katie claims to have met Andy and Mark on the other side, souls waiting to be born. This brings to mind the scriptural passage in which we hear, Before I found you in the womb, I knew you. How do we know that NDEs are real? First, there's an abundance of cases in which the details of events reported by someone having experienced an NDE while clinically dead can be verified. They are remarkably accurate when describing details of their own resuscitation, even when they differ significantly from what is anticipated based on TV shows. Whereas the control group of those without an NDE were vague and highly inaccurate in their guesses. 92% of out-of-body experience case reports were quite detailed and found to be completely accurate when later investigated. In another study, 97.6% of objectively verifiable reports were entirely realistic, despite the patient being clinically comatose at the time of the experience. There are also accurate reports of events that took place in the past for which there is no way the information could have been known, or predicted events that actually took place, or took place at a physically remote location during the NDE. Indy years have accurately recounted details of conversations they could not possibly have heard because they took place in settings completely removed from the location of their physical body or provided information they could not have learned by normal means. Kimberly Clark, a psychologist at Harborview Hospital in Seattle, was counseling a cardiac arrest patient Maria, about life adjustments. The patient refused to listen and kept talking about having floated around the hospital while doctors attempted to restart her heart. The woman insisted there was a tennis shoe with a worn spot near the small toe and one lace tucked under the sole on a third floor ledge. Clark had difficulty locating the shoe but ultimately found it exactly as described by Maria. Maria, a migrant worker, being in Seattle for the first time, suffered a heart attack at night and was rushed to the hospital. The shoe was at a location in the hospital higher than where Maria was located. Clark said the only way Maria could have had a perspective to so accurately describe the shoe was if she had been floating right outside 
and at very close range to the tin issue. Clark's previous skepticism regarding NDEs was gone. An ICU nurse at a Hartford hospital named Joyce Harmon wore plaid shoelaces for the first time. That day, she helped resuscitate a patient. The following day, the patient said, Oh, you're the one with the plaid shoelaces. I was watching what was happening yesterday when I died. I was up above. At the same Hartford Hospital, a clinical instructor named Sue Saunders was attempting to resuscitate a flatline cardiac patient. She was relieved by another person halfway through the resuscitation. A few days later, the revived patient told her that she looked much better in her yellow smock, which she had not worn since the resuscitation. The patient also described the bag valve mask apparatus she had used to resuscitate him. Sue said he would have to have been out of body to have witnessed these details while flatlined. While in a coma, a man's nurse was killed in an automobile accident. She met him on the other side, asked him to return and to tell her parents she still loved them and was sorry she wrecked her 21st birthday present, a red MGB, in which she had died. There was no way he could have known this information by normal means. These reports by NDE experiencers that are later confirmed and could not have been the result of normal sensory processes or logical inference suggest the ability of consciousness to function independent of the physical body. This contradicts one of the most fundamental current assumptions of Western science, that the brain produces conscious experience and thus that consciousness is entirely dependent on brain function. Dr. Eben Alexander stated, the more we come to understand the physical workings of the brain, the more we realize it does not create consciousness at all. We are conscious in spite of our brain. The brain serves more as a reducing valve or a filter that limits consciousness down to a little trickle of here and now in which we find ourselves in this earthly realm. Autistic savant individuals were once called idiot savant due to the lack of normal brain activity. However, they demonstrate extraordinary abilities in certain knowledge or skill thus illustrating the validity of the healthy brain suppressing our consciousness. A peer-reviewed case involved a child waking up from his coma to tell his parents, I've just seen Aunt Nellie in San Francisco, and she said to tell you that she's all right. The parents are astonished to hear this, seeing as they had not seen Aunt Nellie in years, and their son has never met her. But lo and behold, they find out that Aunt Nellie had died of a heart attack at the exact same time and day that their son was undergoing clinical death in St. Louis, Missouri. Another proof of the reality of NDEs are reports of totally blind individuals accurately describing vivid visual events. Dr. Kenneth Ring embarked on a three-year study personally interviewing blind persons who had had NDE experiences. He became quite certain that the blind did see clearly during these experiences. The descriptions of the visual details associated with out-of-body and NDE experiences are essentially identical when reported by both seeing and blind individuals. One woman, Masha, said, it was vision, but I don't think it was my eyes. I don't know how it works because my eyes were back here in my physical body, and since my eyes are not right, 
and I could see everything right. There had to be more special vision somehow. A woman suffered a cardiac arrest during her stay in the hospital. She was unconscious as the resuscitation team tried to revive her. According to her later report, she floated out of her body and stood near the window watching the resuscitation. She observed as they thumped on her chest and pumped air into her lungs. During the resuscitation, a pen fell out of her doctor's pocket and rolled near the same window where her out-of-body spirit was standing and watching. The doctor eventually walked over, picked up the pen, and put it back in his pocket. He then rejoined the frantic effort to save her, and they succeeded. A few days later, she told her doctor that she had observed the resuscitation team at work during her cardiac arrest. No, he soothingly reassured her. You were probably hallucinating. But I saw your pen roll over to the window, she replied. Then she described the pen and other details of the resuscitation. The doctor was shocked. His patient not only had been comatose during the resuscitation, but she had also been blind for many years. A third type of proof of NDE validity are reports following an NDE of information regarding deceased individuals that could not otherwise be known. One example was the death of Aunt Nellie that we learned about a few minutes ago. A nine-year-old boy, Edward Cuomo, encountered several deceased relatives during his NDE, including his sister Teresa, who as far as the family knew was still alive. It was not discovered until the next day that Teresa had been killed in an automobile accident three hours before Edward's recovery. The dramatic changes that occur following an NDE will be explored in a few minutes. There have been at least nine major studies of NDE after effects, and they all show that whatever the nature of the NDE, it is real in its effects. There are thousands of instances wherein a dying person is accompanied as they pass over to the other side by a loved one or someone nearby, like a physician or a nurse. Sometimes the person sharing the NDE learns information about the deceased that is later confirmed and for which they could not have known otherwise. These types of events are called shared death experiences or SDEs. Shared death experiences are often indistinguishable from near death experiences. Bystanders sometimes say they saw a transparent replica of the dying person leave that person's body at the point of death. Or they describe leaving their own bodies and rising up to accompany their dying loved one partway toward the light. Onlookers at someone else's death also sometimes report that a brilliant light filled the room. They heard indescribably beautiful music and or they perceived apparitions of the dead person's deceased loved ones. Occasionally, onlookers report that they co-lived the life review of the deceased person. Shared death experiences are considered to be more reliable evidence of the afterlife than NDEs themselves because there's no way for skeptics to try to attribute them to drugs, lack of oxygen, the dying brain, etc. For the person sharing the death experience is typically quite healthy, both physically and mentally. Having an NDE leaves a deep and lasting mark. Reflect for a moment on this passage from St. Paul's letters of the Galatians. It is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. So let's check out a few of the more common after effects 
of having had an NDE. They have no fear of death because they know it is simply a transition into eternal life. 89% report changes in their life, with the vast majority reporting large changes. These changes often entail major shifts in their priorities, such as away from materialism and towards helping others. Their belief in the afterlife is increased. They sense God's presence. They are aware of and appreciate the meaning, purpose, and sacredness of life. The light tells us that we have a unique gift, an offering to make to the world, and that our happiness and the world's are both fulfilled when we employ that gift, which is our purpose in life. I challenge you to take time this evening to reflect on what your gift is and your purpose in life. Many become unusually sensitive to light, sound, humidity, etc. Often they have a marked increase in electrical sensitivity, unable to wear digital watches, shorting out computers, appliances, cars, etc. One person reported that they felt they had 150 senses on the other side as compared to our very limited five senses here on earth. Can you imagine being able to feel colors or taste words or smell sounds? A high school graduate discovered that due to his infused knowledge, he could now interpret complex equations of nuclear physicists. Where brain damage and retardation might be expected, Good grades and fine behavior were observed. There's also a tremendous thirst for knowledge to somehow recapture the knowledge to which they were exposed while they were in the light. Teen behavior modifications are exceptionally noteworthy. They have excellent family relationships and exhibit maturity and wisdom beyond their years. They abstain from drug abuse or even experimentation. They avoid risk-taking behaviors, have no teenage pregnancies, and very little rebellion. After their NDE, they experience a more purposeful, love-filled life. They want to discover and fulfill their mission in life. Heather reported, a true heart which is motivated by loving compassion, is what matters in life. Our job is to try to love one another no matter what. We must love. That is what we live for. I strongly sense that we are needed, and our worth is how much we can love. Anna Cecilia reported, I felt pleasure, immense peace, a love that I have never felt. I felt complete in myself, fulfilled. Everything made sense. I was finally able to unite all the threads of my existence and understand that for which I had been created and why I was here. I felt an immense love for everyone that was here. Ellen Dye reported, we all know that we came back with a mission. Indie years have a profound understanding of their divine purpose in life. For most, there appears to be a spiritual awakening. The NDE often brings with it spiritual certainty and an intense desire to conform one's life to the divine will. Many indie years, upon return, seek out helping or healing professions. They have an increased awareness of the needs of others and a willingness to reach out to them. Indie ears seek out nature and fresh air. 
One NDA are visiting the Toronto Zoo had all the animals come over to stand in front of her. Many pressed themselves right up against the bars or glass and tried to touch her. Other visitors to the zoo complained that she was hogging all the animals. She was eventually asked to leave the zoo due to the commotion she was causing. People and animals have even followed her home for no discernible reason other than to be with her. In the years feel a life centered on materialistic values and acquisition is empty and pointless. Being somebody important or impressing others ceases to be important. Caring rather than achieving is what really matters. As you can imagine, this can lead to relationship issues when goals suddenly diverge from the expectations of their spouse. Mother Teresa was being driven to an appointment with Pope John Paul II when she spotted a leper alone by the side of the road. She had the driver pull over and she began to care for the leper. She spoke with him at length in order to console him, bringing him the love of God and instilling hope and courage. She ended up late for her appointment. A cardinal pointed out to her that she had kept the vicar of Christ waiting. She replied, Yes, I know. But I met Jesus on the road. Think about how often we fail to acknowledge when we meet Jesus on the road. In 1978, three years after Dr. Raymond Moody's book, Life After Life, brought wide knowledge of the NDE with all its pleasant experiences, a dark cloud of chilling testimony began to penetrate into the previously luminous sky of NDEs. Approximately 20% of reported NDEs are distressing. People who have had pleasant NDEs are reluctant to speak of them for fear they will be ridiculed and considered crazy. Although that is starting to change now that it is a medically recognized phenomenon and more medical staff and counselors are trained to discuss the occurrence and get people to understand that it is normal and not something to be hidden. As you might expect, people who have experienced distressing NDEs have a notorious reluctance to report their distressing NDE, which results in underreporting by an unknown magnitude. Here's a list of typical emotions felt during a distressing NDE. A feeling of extreme fear or panic, emotional and mental anguish, utmost desperation, a great sense of desolation, a void, a vast emptiness. A woman who attempted suicide felt herself sucked into a void. She said, I was being drawn into this dark abyss or tunnel or void. I was not aware of my body as I know it. I was terrified. I had expected nothingness. I expected the big sleep. I expected oblivion. And I found I was going to another plane. And it frightened me. I wanted nothingness. But this force was pulling me somewhere I didn't want to go. As bad as these distressing NDE sound, there are some who experience hell-like experiences. They have a definite sense of being dragged down by some evil force, have visions of wrathful or demonic creatures, sense intense cold or unbearable heat, and hear sounds that resemble the wailing of souls in torment. The NDE researcher, Dr. Jeffrey Long, stated, the most frightening things that I have encountered in my life were not from fictional books 
for scary movies, but from near-death experiences with hellish content. So what type of person do you think has a distressing NDE? Perhaps felons and other unscrupulous people. Perhaps politicians. <laughs> Although you may think that distressing NDEs are reserved for people who have not led what we might call holy lives, the fact is that the outward appearance of one's life is not an indicator of the type of experience a person may have. Convicted felons or persons who have attempted suicide can have pleasant experiences, whereas saintly people may have distressing ones. St. Teresa of Avila considered her many frightening experiences, and I quote, helpful to her spiritual development. She wrote, this vision was one of the most signal favors which the Lord has bestowed upon me. It has been of the greatest benefit to me, both in taking from me all fear of the tribulations and disappointments of this life, and also in strengthening me to suffer them and to give thanks to the Lord, who, as I now believe, has delivered me from such terrible and never-ending torments. That said, hellish NDEs are more likely to be experienced by, but not reserved for, people who tend to be overly focused on the material world and overly disconnected from their spiritual natures. Our Blessed Mother revealed to the children at Fatima, aged 7, 9, and 10, a terrible vision of hell and the vast multitude of souls falling into it, which caused them to be self-sacrificing, penitential, and saintly. Lucia described the vision, saying, Plunged in the flames were demons and lost souls which floated about in the conflagration amid shrieks and groans of sorrow and despair that horrified us and caused us to tremble with fear. Little Jacinta exclaimed, Oh, hell, hell, I am so sorry for the souls who go there. There are three directions or after effects a person experiencing a distressing NDE may have. The first, as you might expect, is when the distressing NDE is interpreted as a warning about unwise or wrong behaviors. A common response is turn around or conversion, often with movement toward a dogmatic religious community. Clinical social worker Kimberly Clark Sharp observed all the people I know who have had negative experiences have become Bible-based Christians. They all feel they have a second chance. An atheistic university professor with an intestinal rupture experienced being torn apart by malicious evil beings. He left his university and attended seminary. On October 18, 1985, Father Stephen Shear was involved in a terrible head-on collision with a pickup truck and with God. He found himself standing before the judgment of Jesus. His sentence from Jesus was hell. He says that the Lord took him through his entire life and showed him how he had failed in his priestly service. His concern was what other priests thought about him and winning people's admiration. At that moment, however, he heard a woman's voice say, Son, will you please spare his life and his eternal soul? The Lord replied, Mother, he's been a priest for 12 years for himself and not for me. Let him reap the punishment he deserves. But son, she said, if we give him special graces and strengths, 
Then let's see if he bears fruit. If not, your will be done. After which Jesus said, Mother, he's yours. The second type of response to the distressing NDE is to defend oneself by dismissing the event as if it did not matter. One woman claimed it was the effect of the ether and not the NDE. Another said, I often wonder if, in the shock of the lion attack, my mind played tricks on me and that I may have just been unconscious and my brain deprived of oxygen. The third type of response is referred to as the long haul because these people struggle for years or many decades with the implications of their distressing NDE. One person said for the next 50 years, I would try to repress the memory of the black threatening experience because it felt so real. It continued to be frightening no matter how old I got. Another said, I've been married for 33 years, and I do not even discuss the experience with my husband. Yet, it is as clear to me today as it was when it happened. A third stated, I just buried the whole thing as deeply as possible. Got very busy. It seems pretty clear to me now that there's some core issue that still needs dealing with. A prominent difference in the after effects of a typical NDE in a distressing NDE relates to the fear of death. With an NDE, that fear is lost because they have very calming experiences of warmth, love, compassion, etc. Following a distressing NDE, the fear of death remains or may actually be heightened. You may have noticed some discrepancies between what I have presented and traditional church teaching. Remember that NDEers did not permanently die. They did not meet their judge for a final sentence of reward or punishment. NDEers are unable to report what lies beyond the boundary. One might ask, why is it that the being of light doesn't prompt non-Catholics to pursue the true faith? Why is it that NDEers the being of light, and persons encountered during the NDE don't appear to be interested in a person's relationship with God. The church's centuries-old history of well-documented accounts of other world contacts clearly confirm that there is a real heaven, but also a purgatory and a hell. We find case after case of persons raised from the dead by various saints, such as St. John Bosco, just long enough to be baptized or have their confessions heard, after which they then succumb. These events confirm how important the state of one's soul at death is to God. Discernment is required to detect satanic deceit. If death is perceived as strictly a pleasant experience, one could presume that how they live their life is unimportant and thus find themselves in the jaws of Satan at the time of their actual permanent death. Fear of hell helped many people get into heaven in the past. It is unlikely today that simply believing that your destination is heaven will keep you out of hell. Jesus taught, how narrow is the gate and straight is the way that leadeth to life and few there are that find it. We find the consequence of not having led a proper life in Jesus' words in scripture. And when the son of man shall come, he shall separate them, sheep on his right, but goats on his left. Then he shall say to them on his left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire. For I was hungry, and you gave me not to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me not to drink. I was a stranger, and you took me not in. Naked, and you covered me not. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. 
Jesus' words echo the NDE message of caring for others, but also enlighten us as to the consequence of failing to do so. If you think you can change your death destination by simply making a good confession when death is expected, think again. We know not the day nor the hour, nor as you just saw, the minute or the second. To review what the NDE has taught us about the afterlife, having normal or enhanced mental processes at a time when brain processes are severely impaired or entirely absent suggests that mental clarity does not depend on a properly functioning brain. Consciousness can function apart from the physical body. Encountering those who have died before us obviously means they continue to exist, as will we. Verified events reported following an NDE that were inaccessible to one's biological senses demonstrate that these experiences are not entirely subjective. We can learn from others' experiences and apply that knowledge to our lives. Dr. Kenneth Ring's wonderful book, Lessons from the Light, tries to convince us to do just that. More importantly, scripture provides guidance regarding life that follows death. We profess in the Apostles' Creed, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, and conclude this proclamation with belief in Life everlasting. Amen. So what have we learned and how can we apply it to our lives? We should strive to live better with greater self-awareness, compassion, and concern for others. Indie years are not merely its recipients, but its messengers. It is up to the rest of us to hear the message, to act on it, and thereby to change the world. As we go through life, especially during challenging times, we should ask ourselves, how would I like to see this scene in my life review? And then act accordingly. We can learn from indie years to develop the capacity to love and acquire knowledge of both the purpose and the most appropriate pursuits of human existence. In scripture we find, let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. We have learned that contrary to traditional neurologist beliefs, consciousness is not dependent on brain function. Consciousness and memory continue even when our bodies have died and the brain is completely non-functioning, deprived of even blood and oxygen. Scientific study of NDEs provides evidence of a transcendent soul and God's unconditional love. Dr. Melvin Moore stated, spiritual visions carry with them an understanding that the process of dying can be joyous and spiritual and that death is not to be feared. It has become quite evident that in addition to indie ears losing their fear of death, that those who have become familiar with NDE experiences and after effects also tend to lose their fear of death. As the philosopher Pierre Teilhard de Chardin stated, we are not human beings having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. Dr. Kenneth Ring states, lessons from the light are not meant for anti years alone, but are given to experiences so that they can come back and infect others with this virus. Let's hope for a pandemic. Small, heartfelt acts of love change lives. 
and ripple across the universe. So although near-death experiences are the primary topic of consideration within this presentation on life after life, Jesus left his burial shroud as additional evidence. The image of Jesus' body on the Shroud of Turin cannot be reproduced with all the technology that exists today. It is highly probable that the image was created by a huge burst of energy that took place during his resurrection, that being his transformation from finite human life to his infinite spiritual life. So I wish to close with the great commandment that Jesus gave us. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. I'm hopeful that the information presented will not only inspire you, but motivate you to action. I look forward to meeting each of you on the other side. May God bless you. Okay, what I'd like to do now is uh, open the floor to any questions that you might have, and I'll attempt to answer them. Yes. I haven't encountered anything like that in my reading, but it's certainly a, an interesting thought, yes. I mean, uh, you know, like you say, there, there's certainly evidence of people that should have transitioned somewhere and seem to be hanging around. So that, I guess there's a, a possibility of that, yes. Yes, uh, I think it's, uh, I forget if it's 3%, I think it's 3% of children report distressing experiences. Yes. Is there really a purgatory? What can we say about that? Okay, I have a couple of books on the table over there. And one is by a father, Shope. And the name of the book is Purgatory. And he goes through hundreds of experiences of people who have had basically contact with people who have been in purgatory. Now, Padre Pio had lots of experiences with people who were in purgatory where they would come to him at night and beg for his prayers and masses to be said for them in order to help uh, them be released from purgatory for you know, for their souls to be purified to the point where they could finally leave purgatory and move on to heaven. And quite often when he did that for these people, that when they were finally released from purgatory, they would appear back to Padre Pio again and they would thank him for all of his prayers and masses and whatever and say, you know, I'm out of here. I'm, I'm finally going where I need to go for, for eternity. So... Uh, but that book is just filled with many, many people having similar types of experiences, what uh, Padre Pio explained uh, in, in uh, you know, the various stories that he told uh, regarding experiences. I know there were times that uh, in the middle of the night, uh, the, the people in the building that he was living in and other cells would hear these commotions and all these voices and stuff coming from Padre Pio's room. And they'd go over and try and, uh, you know, open the door, get into his room. And finally, when he finally would uh, let them in, he would have to explain to them what was happening uh, and the, what the, all those voices were that they were hearing. Because when they finally did get in there, the only person in there was Padre Pio. But uh, he was commonly having those types of experiences. Yes. Okay, so the question is regarding the existence of time. Well, you may have noticed one of the, the very first thing I had in terms of the characteristics of these near-death experiences is the, is the distortion of time. So it's completely different on the other side. You know, uh, 
the fact that a person can relive their entire life from birth to death, every experience they've had, every interaction they've had with another person, what emotion it caused that person to have, and all of that can happen in a fraction of a second during a near-death experience, is you know, significant evidence of the fact that time is very different on the other side. You know, what seems to us to be almost like an eternity during our lives is just uh, you know, such a brief instant uh, on the other side. My wife is asking me to explain about Don Bosco. So it was, uh, it was a young person that had, uh, was dying and kept asking his relatives to summon Don Bosco to come to hear his confession before he died and to give him his blessing. But Don Bosco was, did not arrive in time but they did have someone else come to hear his confession. And uh, that person left and the child died. But when Don Bosco showed up, he prayed over this child and the child came back to life and told John Bosco that he was so happy that he was there because when he did the confession with this other person, he had held back this sin that he didn't want to tell. And it was so important that he be able to tell this sin and get it off his soul so that he could be released, you know, for, for, from purgatory sooner on the other side. So, uh, you know, in this particular, and then afterwards, you know, John Bosco said, well, okay, you know, I've heard your confession now. Uh, do you want to uh, stay back alive? you want to go back to where you were, whatever? And the child chose to. Uh, well, my wife says, no, that didn't happen. I'm thinking, mixing it with another story. Oh, <laughs> I, I missed part of the story. So uh, the, the child, when he came back to life, uh, stated that uh, he had been, was being dragged down to hell as a result of this sin that he had not confessed to the other priest. And of course now he did confess that sin uh, to Don Bosco. We need to get another microphone here. <laughs> but, but Mary, what? Okay. Yeah, so, so, ah, okay. Okay, so Mary appeared and uh, said that, uh, and he said, you know, she was such a very beautiful woman who came and said, he hasn't been judged yet. You can't take him. And that's when John Bosco was able to hear his confession. <laughs> right, they had, he had not been judged yet. Okay, next question. <laughs> She's going to beat me up after this. <laughs> All right, next Sure. Not entirely sure what's going to happen here because this is a, a hidden slide, so we'll see what happens. But uh, I may just have to go through some uh, maneuvering to get it to display. But. So imagine what the world would be like if all people experienced NDEs and changed their behaviors accordingly. Great. We learn from the Egyptian Book of the Dead that each new king was required to participate in a ritual that would induce a near-death experience. 
They were sealed in a coffin, deprived of life-giving oxygen until they expired. And then after a predetermined time, the coffin was opened and the king resuscitated. The NDE provided the new king with absolute proof of eternal life. These kings were transformed by the humbling and exalting experience of their death. They developed a reverence for the love that people share with one another. This book, the Egyptian Book of the Dead, describes the death journey beginning with a judgment scene and goes on to reveal God and various voices, continues on a long boat trip through a dark tunnel, and ends with union with a bright light. Similar journeys can be found in the ancient Tibetan Book of the Dead, as well as the Aztec Song of the Dead. And we have panels associated with each of these three books uh, as part of the exhibit that's up here. Okay, did that address your, your question? All right. Any more questions? Yes. Yeah, so the question is regarding the choice that's given to some people regarding whether or not they're allowed to actually return. Oftentimes, people are given a choice. From what I've read, most of the time when they're given a choice, their desire is fulfilled. Other times, they, they are told that, you know, that they don't want to go back, but they're told, no, you do need to go back. You have things that need to be accomplished. You know. So, you know, they don't always get the choice. Sometimes they're sent back regardless of whether they want to. And you heard me talk about people like that that did not want to go back, like Michael, the very first kid I talked about, like uh, Pam Reynolds and how... You know, she didn't want to re-enter her body. It was all messed up, and you know, uh, but her uncle pushed her back into her body when they were doing the defibrillator shocks. So, you know, so people don't always get the choice uh, to go back. And uh, yeah. No, I mean, that I, I think you're asking about, in the case of Pam Reynolds, was there some expectation that something was going to happen, something was going to happen relative to an NDE, and they were going to try and measure it? No. I mean, all they were doing was just the normal procedures they would normally accomplish during the surgery. They were making records of all of the things that took place during that surgery, each step by step along the way. And it was a rather unusual uh, you know, surgery in the sense that it was so long, seven hours long, and the person was going to be clearly dead for an hour during that process. You know, you know, no oxygen, no blood flow, uh, completely draining all the blood from the head. Uh, there was no way that she could be alive or the brain could be functioning during that time. However, her consciousness continued despite, you know, the fact that there was no physical life left in there as we would expect it to be. Well, the, uh, uh, the annals of the uh, New York uh, Academy of Science, I said they just this past year uh, published a paper saying NDEs are real. These are things that we know happen during NDEs. And what they did is they said, we need to set up special guidelines of how to guide the researchers in order to acquire more information in these various things that can happen uh, during NDEs. So, you know, it's, it's acknowledged scientifically to be real. Uh, you saw the evidence of how the statistics are changing and how through the co cosmological evidence 
and the study of near-death experiences that even the scientists now are proclaiming that they are theists, believing in God. Uh, I mean, all, whenever I go to the news, all I find is people who have uh, accidentally acknowledged that they happen to have a belief in God and they're a, a, a professor at a university and they're fired despite the fact that they have tenure and everything for expressing such a thought, you know? So uh, we live in a pretty strange world right now and it seems to be getting stranger with each passing day. Yes. And my wife was asking me to talk about saints who raised the dead. Anybody ever heard of Saint Stanislaw? Poland? Uh, I'm probably going to get this one all messed up too. <laughs> okay. So uh, there, were, there was a ruler in this area of Poland who wanted to acquire some property and it was in the possession of the church. So the ruler got together with some of the relatives of the person who had sold the property to the church and said, if you will conspire with me in order to get the property transferred, I will reward you for your efforts. So St. Stanislaw you know, was the one defending the fact that the church had purchased this property. And they had a trial. And, you know, these relatives were coming to the trial and saying, oh, no, they, you know, my, my relative who died didn't sell it to the church. Uh, that's false information that Stanislaw is providing you. So what St. Stanislaw did is uh, he got several days that he could uh, go pray and fast and whatever. And then he and all the people in the court went to the cemetery. They dug up the body of this person who had died several years earlier. St. Stanislaw touched his body with his shaft, his uh, what, crochet, and all of a sudden, all, the, all that you have there in the grave was these bones, but the flesh started to appear on the bones, and basically, you know, his body was recomposed. He climbs out of the hole in the ground, naked, and is escorted back to the court by all the people who were witness him coming back to life. Goes to the court, and says, oh, no, I sold that property to the church. So it's theirs. You have no right to it, to try and take it away from the church. And then he proceeded to chastise all his relatives who were supposed to have been praying for him after his death in order to help them get through this purgatory process quicker. So he was really upset with them. And then Stanislaus said to him, that, you know, you're, you're back to life now. Would you like to stay here among us for, you know, a few more years or whatever? And he says, no. He said, I'm in purgatory, but I know that my final destination is going to be heaven. I just get, need to get through this purification process. So I want to go back to where I was because if I stay here, I could really mess things up and change my destination. So, everybody in the court goes back to the cemetery with this guy. He climbs back down into the hole, lays down on the, on the ground like this, and all of a sudden his, uh, the flesh comes off of his bones. They fill in the hole. <laughs> and that's kind of the end of the story, but it's kind of a remarkable one. <laughs> yes. Any more questions? Yes, there's a book that we have on the table over there that's called Saints Who Raised the Dead. And it's got lots of very remarkable stories in it, such as the one I just talked about. And the one I just talked about, I have seen in five or six different books. So 
It's very commonly quoted. Any other questions? I want to, yes, Tom. Do people uh, that belong to religions who believe in reincarnation have near-death experiences? Well, the answer is yes. And what's kind of remarkable is that sometimes it's the children who die and have these near-death experiences, and when they come back and they're questioned about you know, what happened, they talk about having met Jesus. And you know, the parents say, well, you know, who is this person you're talking about? We never talked to you about anybody with that name. And he said, well, that's the person I met when I was on the other side. So uh, you know, that's kind of interesting. Uh, as far as reincarnation is concerned, of course, they believe that everybody gets reincarnated over and over again and whatever. There actually is evidence that there are some people that when they die and return back, they don't necessarily go back into the same body that they were in before. It's very rare but there are a few recorded instances where the evidence appears to be overwhelming that this person did have a previous life and can recall these events that there's no way they could have known about them. And um, I, I think it might be situations where maybe the original body that they had was ground up in a meat grinder or something and there's no way that they could have come back to that same body, but they had a mission to accomplish and that may be the explanation for why it happened. But like I said, it's very, very rare. It's not like what the, they might believe in terms of reincarnation just being a normal process. Okay. Yes. What about ghosts? Is that the question? Well, ghosts are just the spirits. You know, the question is, of course, uh, um, Why are they still hanging around? That's probably what you're trying to get to, right? Which kind of comes back to the question that we heard a little bit earlier, right? Yeah, so uh, I think there's a lot of evidence for the existence of ghosts. Obviously, the fact that our consciousness functions apart from our body, and there are lots of people who experience seeing a ghostly-like form leave the body at the moment of death. In fact, uh, a few months ago, I was doing a presentation down in Florida, and this gentleman told me that his son had died several times. And this time, he was there with his son, and his son passes, but he can see his son's spirit leave the body, and it starts to ascend. And as the spirit is ascending, the dad is watching it as it goes up, you know, like this. And then the doctors resuscitate him, and the spirit came back into his body. And when he came back to life, he turned to his dad and he said, Dad, I could see you watching me as I was leaving my body. Okay. So, I mean, that's an example of what we would call a ghost, right? In that particular instance, it was not a long-lived hanging around for you know, a great deal of time. But uh, I don't understand you know, why there are some people who seem to hang around for a considerable periods of time before they finally let go. There's some, something that's missing that needs to be accomplished in order for them to, to get across. Uh, I don't have a lot of research on that topic, but... Uh, there definitely is evidence about the existence of people's souls uh, being here uh, for more than just you know, an instant or a few minutes or whatever. Any more questions? Okay. You've been a great audience. I really appreciate all the questions. I mean, that's really where we learn is, you know, when we not listening to me up here talking, it's when we get around to actually talking about the material that we get to learn a lot more. So uh, I appreciate it. I think uh, 
this is one of the two top groups I think I've had for an audience in terms of being able to ask a lot of questions and get dialogue going. So I appreciate that. Thank you. God bless you. I'd just like to remind you that the exhibit is still open, so you're welcome to go up there, and we have lots of amazing stories of people uh, having near-death experiences, shared-death experiences, just the general characteristics of near-death experiences, uh, the NDE experiences in the Bible, the Blessed Mother and her, her experience and the Assumption, all kinds of stories over there, and we also have uh, some relics over there for veneration, uh, if you're interested in doing that. Uh, so. You know, you have uh, holy pictures, medals, rosary beads. If you'd like to touch to the relics, they will become third-class relics. Thank you. <laughs>